I'm looking forward to cereal. <laughs> but I want to have, I got a request. I want a bowl that Jethro Bodine uh, eats out of. So <laughs> It's good to be back. I tell you what, I like to, I like to preach out from my home church sometimes. It revives me. It, somehow it recharges my battery. And I like to be here that you're a good church and love your pastor and his family. Known them a good while now. And uh, it's just, it's always a treat for me when I, well, when I get to come, get to come back. I was thinking about what today is, April the 14th. Uh, I had a preacher friend in Kansas, Iola, Kansas, where I pastored seven years. Uh, I recommended to the church when I left that they call him Brother Marion Sponsler, and uh, they did call him. And his birthday was today, but uh, two years ago in April, he went home to be with the Lord. And he had a daughter uh, that went home to be with the Lord. And he still has uh, two daughters living, Melissa and Melinda Sponsler. As a matter of fact, they were a family of M's. It was Marion, Marilyn, Melinda, uh, Melanie, and Melissa. And a family of M's. And uh, today was his birthday. He's been in heaven now a couple years. He was a... Uh, he was a man of God. I used to tease him. April the 14th is when the, uh, uh, the Titanic sunk. It's the, rec- it's the anniversary of the Titanic sinking. And I told him, the year you was born, it sunk. <laughs> and we used to get a good laugh about that. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter number 26. Tonight I want to preach about a preacher, uh, not very well known, but there's a few verses in the Bible about him. He was what his life teaches us some of the most powerful lessons in the Word of God. You can look at his life and hear what I'm going to say tonight about him, and I believe you'll agree with me that he was one of the most powerful preachers and had the most powerful lessons to teach us in all the Bible. He was one of the first 12 preachers. As a matter of fact, he was the first treasure of the first church, and his name was Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. Hard to believe, but he really was a powerful preacher, many of the most important life lessons we learn from his ministry. And I'll share with you here in a few moments, and I believe you'll agree with me when I say that we learn some most powerful truths in all the Bible. He's uh, not well not well known. There's not a lot we know about Judas. Uh, But he does teach us these lessons. He was so close to eternal life, but he was so far away. He was so close. He was so close to eternal life, yet he missed it. He was religious, but he was lost. Now, there are some people have the idea that Judas lost his salvation. But the Bible tells us Judas was never saved. He didn't lose his salvation. And the Lord picked Judas knowing what Judas was going to do. The Lord in his foreknowledge knew what Judas would do and he picked Judas anyway. Some people have the idea that poor Judas didn't have a choice, but he did have a choice. He had a choice. God, Jesus 
uh, gave him an open opportunity to profess faith in Christ and to, make, and to make him his Savior. But Judas wanted the 30 pieces of silver more than he wanted his soul. He sold out his soul for 30 pieces of silver. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the music that has blessed our souls. And Lord, we pray that as we look at the lessons that Judas taught us, that we will remember them and that we would, uh, we would be able to uh, mimic the, some of the things that his life teaches us. And Lord, speak to us now through thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 26 and verse number 14. The word of God declares, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such, uh, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, that The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Verse 19, And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily or truly, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Can you imagine what they were thinking? And they said, Lord, is it I? They all said that in verse 23. And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had never been born. Now notice verse 25. Then Judas which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. In other words, Jesus said to him, You're right. You're right. It's you. You're the one that's going to betray me. We see these things in Matthew 26. Now, in Matthew 27, if you'll turn to the next chapter, Matthew chapter number 27, that I want to show you some things that he says here in verse about Judas. Verse number 3 of Matthew 27. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself. Now notice it said he repented himself. He did not repent. He did not repent of his sin. It says he repented himself in verse 3 and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to, to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed 
and went and hanged himself. And the chief priests took the silver, silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for thee to put them in the treasury, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. And I'll leave off, leave off reading there. But here we see the life of Judas teaches us many things. First of all, he teaches us the power of choice, the power to choose. You realize tonight that you and I, we decide whether we go to heaven or hell. We make that decision. And you may be on the Internet, and there's never been a time when you called on the Lord uh, as your Savior, and you have maybe chosen that you're not interested in that. He loved you. Jesus loved you with an everlasting love. Jesus loved Judas. It broke the heart of Jesus to see what Judas did. Judas teaches us the power of choice. It was Joshua who, it was uh, Joshua who said, what did he say? I forgot what he said. <laughs> Do what? As for me and my house, thank you. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. It was Joshua who said, choose you this day whom you will serve. The power of choice. When I was 11, year old, 11 years old in the little town of 56, Arkansas. Anybody know where 56 is? Few of you do. Well, I, in a revival meeting, I walked down an aisle, and in the 56 Missionary Baptist Church, I called on the name of the Lord, and he saved my soul and gave me everlasting life. And I'm glad that I made that choice so young in life. I missed out on a lot of sin. Now, that's not to say I didn't sin, but what I'm saying is I missed out on a lifetime of sin. And I'm thankful. I never chased any wild women. Well, I had one girlfriend was kind of wild, but <laughs> I never chased wild women. I never went to the honky-tonks at night. I never, uh, I never was immoral. There's a lot of things that I never was. But I was a sinner, just to say. And I knew I was lost. And I knew that if I died without Christ, I knew that I would die and go to hell. So I came and my brother... Terry, we both came down the altar the same time and we both gave our heart to Jesus Christ. He shows us the power of choice. Let me ask you tonight, how have, have you chosen? What have you chosen? Have you chosen eternal life or have you chosen to go on in your sin? My prayer is that you have chosen eternal life. But there's a second lesson that Judas teaches us, and that is he shows us that Jesus was a friend of sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Hey, listen, I'm glad Jesus is a friend of sinners. You know why? Because there'd be no hope for you or I if Jesus was not a friend of sinners. When I was 11 years old and got under conviction by the Holy Spirit, I felt like I was the worst sinner that ever lived. The Lord convicted me of my sin, and I knew I was a sinner, and I knew that Jesus loved me. I knew he died on the cross for me. And I knew he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, he ro rose from the dead 
and victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And I knew that I could choose to accept him. And I opened up my heart to him. And I asked him to save me. He shows that Jesus is a friend of sinners. Let me show you something about Judas that I didn't, I didn't read a while ago. Matthew 26, Matthew 26 and verse number 47. It says, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. I didn't read this scripture a while ago. Verse 48, Now he that betrayeth, him gaveth them a sign, saying, Whosoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus. Now picture this in your mind. He came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Can you imagine how close he was to salvation? He came to Jesus and he kissed him, an expression of love. But in this case, in Judas's case, it was an expression of betrayal. It says he kissed him. In verse 50, notice what Jesus said. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Now, Jesus knew where Judas had been, but he wanted Judas to think about it, and he called him friend. He said, Friend, whereof art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were, which, uh, were with Jesus stretched out his hand drew his sword and struck a servant on the high priest and smote off his ear, and I'll leave off reading there. But here Jesus called Judas friend. He said, friend, where have you come? Brother Brooks, I can't hardly even imagine what it would be like to look at Jesus Christ and to kiss him and to walk away unchanged, to walk away lost, to walk away eternally damned forever, to lose your soul, to be so close. Judas heard the sermons. Judas saw the miracles. Judas was in the front seat with all the other disciples, and yet Judas was able to kiss him and walk away unsaved. He was a friend. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Makes me think, back when I was a kid, I, I got an eight-track player. You remember the eight-track players in the 80s? I got an eight-track uh, player, and my brother bought an eight-track tape of Donnie and Marie, Donnie and Marie Osmond. And they sang a song, Paper Roses. And that makes, when I think of Judas, I think of that song. And that song goes something like this. Paper roses, paper roses, oh, how real that they seem to me. But they're only imitation like your imitation love for me. I think of Judas every time, and I think of that song every time I think of Judas. Judas had fake love. He was a trickster. He was a deceiver. He was fake. He was phony. He was not genuine. He was ungenuine. 
But here we see Jesus loved him anyway. You may be out there tonight and you may say, you don't know what all I've done, what all the sin I've committed. It doesn't matter. Jesus loves you and he'll change your life. He'll, re he'll, he'll revolutionize your life. You don't have to worry about what you have been. Just come running to Jesus and he'll change your life. He'll get a, give you a song. You'll have a song in your heart and you'll walk a different walk and you'll talk a different talk and you'll live a different live, a different life. When I got saved, I got out of the sin business. It didn't mean I'd quit sinning. None of us can quit sinning. But what I mean is I didn't, I didn't wallow in my sin. I didn't live in my sin. When I came to Jesus, I knew that God had, had saved me. The Lord had saved me. And I knew that I was supposed to live a different life than the unsaved. A lot of people have been saved for ages don't understand that. It's hard to imagine. But there are professing believers tonight. They don't even understand that. They're, they're still wanting to be in sync with the world. They're still wanting to be like the average Joe. They want to kind of blend in. Hey, listen, I don't want to blend in. I'm going a different direction. I'm going the Jesus route. I'm going his, I'm going his way. When he saved me and he put a burden in my heart, and I believe I was I believe I was called to preach and I got saved. When God saved me, he gave me a desire. I remember I used to daydream about taking Bibles and taking crosses and taking to people's houses and giving them crosses and giving them Bibles. I used to daydream about preaching before I knew anything about much anything. I had a desire to do something like that for the Lord. I believe the Lord called me to preach the moment he saved me. I believe that's what he wanted me to do, and I realized it later on in life. Not much later, when I was 18 years old, March the 7th, I turned 18, and March the 11th, I walked down an aisle, and I said, Brother Brown, I don't understand it, but God's called me to preach. Brother Brown said, I don't understand it either. <laughs> no, he didn't say that, but he should have, because I know he was thinking it. <laughs> I know he was thinking that he should have said something like that. Judas also shows us that religion is not enough. If religion would save you, Judas would have been saved. He was religious. Judas knew the right words. He knew the right phrases. He knew the, uh, he knew the ropes as far as being a disciple and being a teacher and a, a preacher, he knew the ropes, but he never was saved. He, he, he was religious, but he was lost. I remember when I pastored in Iowa, Kansas, had a dear lady come to hear me preach. She visited the church. She was probably in her 70s or 80 maybe, and she heard me preach, and she went home. Wasn't too long after that, I believe it was the same week, maybe a week later, she called me up and she said, Preacher, she said, you said something Sunday that interested me. And I thought, what is, what is she going to say? She said, you said something about being born again. She said, I'm not sure I understand what that is, but I think that's what I need to do. Can you help me? And I said, yes, ma'am, I can. My wife and I will be over there as soon as we can get there. And she told me that she had been in church all of her life. She told us that she had taught Sunday school at one time or another, but she had never been born again, and she had never heard 
a preacher talk about being born again. She was from a different denomination. And she said they don't talk about that at that church. And we prayed in just a moment. She had joy all over her. And uh, she got ready for baptism. We baptized her. She brought a whole bunch of her family. A whole bunch of her family came. And they heard me preach about being born again as well. And we baptized her, and she was a sweet lady. Melissa, do you remember what her name was? I don't remember her name, but she was was a sweetheart. She loved the Lord. She loved the church. She loved the pastor and his wife, and she was a sweetheart. But, But... Judas also teaches us the need of a spiritual birth. A physical birth is a beginning, but a spiritual birth is eternal and everlasting. Everybody needs a spiritual birth. You must be born again. And he didn't say born again and again and again. He said born again. Again, you can only be born twice. And if you're born twice, you die once. But if you're born once, you die twice. Judas teaches us the need of a spiritual birth. Judas makes us grieve his sin as we should grieve our own. Judas makes us grieve his sin Here Judas kissed the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought about what Jesus said on another occasion. He said, they draw nigh unto me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Their heart is far from me. Can I ask you the question tonight? How is your heart? Is your heart right with God? Have you given your heart to Jesus Christ? Does the Savior, does the Savior be, is is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? Is he your Master? I pray he is, because I guarantee you, life will be a whole lot better for you than before you were saved. Doesn't mean you won't have trouble, but it'll mean that you'll have the one who cares about all things. You'll have him in your corner, and he will be with you until the end of the age. Born again, a spiritual birth. We should grieve his sin as we grieve our own sin. He also shows us our own sin nature. He shows us our sin nature. What was Judas' big problem? He was selfish. He was selfish. He didn't serve Christ, really. He served self. He didn't live for Christ, really. He lived for self. See, a lost person, all they know is that it's all about me. Life is there to make me happy. And I should get what I wish. And I should get what I want. And I should do what I want to do. And nobody else is going to tell me how I can live my life. You'd be surprised how many lost people I've talked to that said that. No preacher. I don't want to hear any preacher hollering and screaming and telling me that I need to get saved and I need to get to church. I don't want to hear any preacher telling me that. I've heard a lot of people say that. See, the sin nature is selfish. And guess what, Christian? We all have one. We all have one. We need to, we need to be aware of our sin nature. We need to keep our sin nature in check. We need to walk in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit of God because the sin nature is in every one of us 
And the Christian life is not a natural life, it's a supernatural life. And it takes supernatural power to live the Christian life. Occasionally, I'll have people tell me, well, preacher, I'd get saved, but I'm afraid I can't live it. And I always tell them, you can't live it. I can't live it. But there's somebody inside that can help you to live it. I can't live the Christian life. It's a supernatural life. It's a life that's beyond my uh, understanding. It, it far surpasses my, my ability to, uh, to ponder. But I can live the Christian life if I let Jesus live his life through me. That's the answer for the Christian life. Not trying to do the best you can, but letting Jesus do his work. In your life, he makes us grieve his sin, but also he he shows us God's great love. He shows us God's great love. Jesus loved Judas, but Ju- Judas did not love Jesus. Ju- Jesus loved him. When Jesus saw him and said, "Friend." Where art thou come? The heart of our Savior was broken. He loved Judas. And, I, and I'm sure he must have felt like uh, hopefully he'll change his mind. But he didn't. Judas loved the silver more than he loved the Savior. And later when it was too late, Judas realized what he'd done and he threw the silver down. And he wouldn't have anything to do with it. But it was too late. He'd already sold his soul out uh, to sin. He shows us God's great, gracious love. God's love. He is gracious. He is a gracious God. He gives us grace that we do not deserve. He gives us mercy. He gives us pardon. He gives us forgiveness. God, the Lord just keeps giving. And he just keeps giving. Hey, listen, if you accept Christ as your Savior, God will do a work in your life and you'll shake your head and you won't even begin to imagine what God's done in your life. I'm not the same Randy Zinn I was when I was 11 years old. When I was 12 years old, I was not the same Randy Zinn that I was when I was 11. When Jesus comes in, things change, amen? I didn't get without sin. I didn't get sinless, but I tell you what, I sin less and less. I, I, I got out of the sin business when I got saved. I know and I understand where it comes from. But I hear people say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. If it wasn't for just, I could agree with that. But I can't agree with saying I'm just a sinner saved by grace because I'm a child of God. (laughs) I'm a king's kid, amen. I'm a child of the living God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior God Almighty is my Father. I'm an heir of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I'm I'm a I'm I'm royal. I have the royal, rich, red, redeeming blood of Christ that washes me away from uh, washes my sins away from me. I can't say I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm more than that. I'm ki- the Bible says he will make us kings and priests. I don't understand what all that means, but I know it's going to happen because the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5, he tells us that. Here Judas teaches us that God's gracious love is available to whosoever will let him come. Let's bow our heads, please.
our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I pray tonight you're saved, you love the Lord. I pray tonight you learn something that, uh, that will benefit your spiritual life. If you're here tonight or if you're on the internet and you've never come to Jesus as your Savior, I pray tonight you will do that. I pray you'll open up your heart and invite Jesus Christ to come into your heart, come into your life and change your life. It won't make you perfect and it won't make it where you don't have problems but you'll have the one that can help you and that can solve your problems. You'll have the one that can change your life and will continue to change your life as you walk with him. Don't be like Judas. Don't be so close and yet so far away. Let the lessons that Judas' life teaches us, let those lessons be, be a part of your life so that you will be what God wants you to be. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm going to ask the pastor to come.